Hi guys, welcome to this video on Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, ADHD, in the specialist theme of psychiatry. So for the introduction, I'm going to ask a few questions to see what you know. So which one is the biggest causing factors of ADHD? Is it A, genetics, B, diet, C, school, or D, preschool? Have a little think about what causes ADHD if you know. So the answer is A, genetics. Um, genetics contributes around 76% to ADHD actually, which is one of the highest of all psychiatric illnesses. So just remember in your history taking to make sure you do your family history because um, that's important. So question two, what characterises ADHD? Is it A, quietness, B, impaired attention, C, hyperactivity, or D, impulsivity. Have a little think about what a child with ADHD um, might have in terms of symptoms. So the answer is B, C, and D. So ADHD has two sets of symptoms, really. The first one is impaired attention, which is the AD part of the name ADHD. And the second one is hyperactivity or impulsivity, which is the last part of the name ADHD. Um, the reason why I put quietness as an answer is because actually children with ADHD are the opposite of quietness. They often are really noisy and they talk excessively and um, they have trouble playing quietly and they often end up interrupting others. So question three, who does ADHD affect? Is it A preschool children, B school aged children, C all children? Or D adults. Think about genetic and environmental influences here. If there are any, how long do they act for? So the answer is all of them actually. So with ADHD it tends to diagnose itself at around the time when a child goes to school which tends to be around age seven-ish. Um, and the reason being is because before this there is such a great variation in behaviour of preschool children that it would be really difficult to say what's normal and what's abnormal. Whereas when they're all put in together into school, you can identify the ones that are maybe a bit too hyperactive um, and have a bit of an abnormal behaviour compared to the rest of the school cohort. So that's why there's more prevalence of school-aged children with ADHD. Um, and 15% of these will carry on their symptoms into adulthood, which means it transfer to adult mental health services. But... Um, in total, because it is genetic um, predisposition with environmental factors as well, you can have ADHD at any age. So, we've just done our introduction. We're going to go through what ADHD is, symptoms and history, investigations, differentials, clinical examination and OSCE tips, and then a quick summary, and we'll go over those questions again to see what you've learned. So, what is ADHD? So ADHD stands for Attention Deficit slash Hyperactivity Disorder. It's a hyperkinetic behavioural disorder that is acquired. This is important to note because although there is um, a large genetic contribution to this, it is acquired, which suggests that there are environmental factors involved as well. So onset is usually in childhood or adolescence. So the prevalence of um, school-aged children with ADHD is around 1%. But in males, it's three times as high as it is in females. So as we just spoke about, it is highly heritable. Um, so to make sure to go through your family history in your history taking. Um, and symptoms are likely to be due to environmental factors playing on a genetic predisposition. And important to remember, environmental factors include pre and perinatal factors and psychosocial factors. So remember to also ask these in your history taking. So symptoms of ADHD. So it usually manifests before the age of seven and it's characterised by two sets of symptoms. The first one is impaired attention. The way I like to think about and remember these symptoms is imagine a child in a school setting, school surroundings, um, for example, in a class at school with a teacher. So this is how I'll relate um, the symptoms across. So a child who is 
finding it difficult to keep attention um, on their work in class or when they're playing a task. Um, when the teacher speaks to them, they don't listen and they're very distractible. They'll move from one activity to, activity to another easily. Um, they're reluctant to engage in activities that um, require quite a lot of concentration so they don't end up doing their homework for school and they can be forgetful or regularly lose things. So the second set of symptoms um, is hyperactivity and or impulsivity. So these involve, um, hyperactivity first involves restlessness, constant fidgeting, running and jumping around inappropriate, in inappropriate situations. For example, um, story time in class, all the children are sitting on the carpet and there's one child who's talking or being noisy, can't engage in this quiet activity, is running around. So moving on to impulsivity. This involves difficulty waiting their turns, interrupting others' conversations, blurting out answers that the teacher asks, and not allowing others to answer. And so for symptoms of ADHD, you want to have both um, symptoms from both of those two sets. So your history. So important to listen to both the patient and the parent. This is important to take history from both, not just focus on one or the other. So presenting complaint, is the child impulsive, inattentive, hyperactive and you need examples of when the child has been like this, you know, it says it in the name, ADHD. So history of presenting complaint, so what age or gender is the child because you know there's differences in prevalence, what is the child like at home and what is the child like in other social situations, for example school is a key question for diagnosis which we'll move on to. The next question is, has the child has this been going on for more than six months? Which is also a key question for diagnosis. So other questions you can ask are, is there any possible causes? Do they have any learning difficulties? Any trouble at school with homework or their school reports? How do they do playing sports games or games with their friends? How's their mental health and how is their sleep? Which are questions you might not think to ask but are important. So for the past medical history, first you want to know if there's any developmental or neuro problems um, with the child their self, but then you also want to know about the mom, about the mom's pregnancy, about the mom's labour, about um, neonatal complications, was the baby in recess or incubation, low birth weight, etc. And then remember your family history, because we spoke about the high um genetic heritability so is there a history of ADHD or other mental health conditions um, and then moving on to your social history this is also very important um, is there any social deprivation neglect in childhood family stresses impact of symptoms on life because all of these are environmental um, factors that can affect ADHD and worsen prognosis so I remember to ask the parents and ask the child questions so investigations. So in making the ADHD diagnosis, firstly, symptoms need to be in more than one situation. So for example, symptoms are occurring at school and they are occurring at home. Secondly, the symptoms should have been present for at least six months. You're looking for over six months. So diagnosis is made by a specialist, um, a psychiatrist or a paediatrician with an expertise in ADHD. Um, it should be based on a full clinical and psychosocial assessment. This includes developmental history, assessment of impairment, observer report and mental state examination. So management. So psychosocial intervention is recommended in all cases. Now for a child with mild to moderate ADHD, the first line is this psychosocial interventions. So what this includes is strategies to help parents understand or train um, their child, cognitive behavioural therapy and social skills training. Now, if the child has severe ADHD, the first line therapy on top of the psychosocial intervention is actually pharmacological treatment. And so the drug of choice is methylphenidate, which is a central nervous system stimulant. Now, something to note about this is prolonged use is associated with growth suppression. So regular checkups on weight and height is required and it can only be prescribed by a specialist. But if it's not tolerated or ineffective, there are other drugs mentioned there that can be used. So prognosis. Improvement usually occurs with development and remission of symptoms is often between the ages of 12 to 20. 
Um, the problem is unstable family dynamics and coexisting conduct disorder can be associated with a worse prognosis. Around 15% of children who have symptoms persist with these symptoms into later life and so need to be passed on to the management from the adult mental health team. So your differentials. Something important is to note the normal variation of behaviours and not to mistake a child with, with a normal variation with ADHD. This is why in particular diagnosis isn't usually made before school. Misdiagnosis can also happen in children that are placed in academic settings inappropriate to their intellectual ability. So this can be children with learning difficulties put in a highly intelligent environment or highly intelligent children in an understimulating environment and this can mimic the symptoms of ADHD. So other differentials are other mental health illnesses um, such as autism, Asperger's disease, um, or even children with agitated depression or anxiety can be a differential to consider and remember. So clinical examination. So firstly, general observation. How does the child respond around you or to you when you're speaking to them? And how do they respond or speak to their parents? Um, a neurological and developmental examination is key and the mental state examination is also done. So this assesses a patient's current state of mind and includes all of the following. So OSCE tips. So your history is important and make sure you speak to the child and the parent. Don't just speak to one or the other. Observation is important too. Um, not only do you ask, are they impulsive, inattentive, hyperactive in the history, you observe when they come in to your clinic, are they impulsive, are they inattentive, are they hyperactive with your own eyes? And then developmental assessment is also key. The mental state examination is also key for diagnosis. So to summarise, let's go back to the questions that we should know now from the start. So question one, which is one of the biggest causing factors of ADHD? Here are your answers. So genetics, what we learned was it's one of the biggest contributing factors for ADHD. Remember to ask about this in your family history. Question two, what characterises ADHD? Here are your answers. Remember what ADHD stands for. It stands for Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. It says it in the name really. And remember these children are not quiet. If anything, they are noisy. And last question, who does ADHD affect? So we now know it is all of these answers um, most prevalent in school age children, most develop out of it, but 15% can persist into adulthood. Um, thank you very much.